Ready? Okay. Uh, good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome to the Zoning Board of Appeals meeting for December 19th, 2018. Uh, the first order of business is to review and approve the minutes of the November 14th meeting. And um, I know, Tim, you had some suggestions which were... Right. Um, I actually uh, reviewed these things, and on the second page, uh, I had a correction which I discussed with Chris. It's on the uh, under uh, Goomer Hollow. It's the second paragraph, and uh, one, two, three, four, about five uh, sentences down, or five lines down. It says Sun Common and Solar Communities are no longer represented by uh, Mr. Bergen's firm. We never represented them. So it, and it's said above that we never represented them. So I, um, I would uh, move that we strike that sentence since it's um, inaccurate. All right. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the only correction I have. Does uh, anybody have any other corrections, mm -hmm. nope. concerns, comments? Okay, uh, with that correction, I would move that we accept the minutes as presented for the meeting of November 14th. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, carried. Do you want to put abstention or? Yes. Okay, mark him as abstained. All right, we have no new business. Uh, we're a little ahead of schedule. I don't know, are um, there folks here for the Gerber matter? Mr. Andros? Yes. Okay. Um, John, you want to press on with that even though we're a couple minutes early? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Right. Is still from 2019? Oh, that's right. Yeah, we, um, we can do one uh, kind of ministerial thing. We have um, Chris presented to us the um, Zoning Board of Appeals 2019 meeting schedule. I don't know if you folks all had a chance to um, take a look at it. It seems to conform with what we've done in the past. And uh, I assume the dates are correct? Yeah. Okay. The only exception be January correct. Right. Right. And does anybody have any questions, concerns, comments about that? Nope. Okay. I'd make a motion that we approve the uh, Zoning Board of Appeals 2019 meeting schedule as presented. Do I have a second? Second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? All right. Thank you. Different. Is that on the agenda or? It's on the, um, um, the me it has this has this has meeting dates and then agenda close date okay next to I just it. So to it make has, sure that yeah it has both of those okay great and and I assume uh, Chris that'll be on the, the website and yes. that kind of stuff so people will know there you go all right um since we've taken care of that, we might as well get going with the, uh, the Gerber application. So if uh, you could just uh, uh, go up and present to the audience uh, what the application involves, okay. explain it. Uh, I know you did when you uh, presented the application originally. Um, is there anybody here for that application? Anybody in the audience? Okay, well presented anyway. Okay. My name is Pete Ambrose, I'm a consulting engineer, and I represent the applicant, which is the Gerber Revocable Trust, um, in the matter of uh, requesting two variances from the um, bulk regulations of the town of Rhinebeck for a lot, which is located on the corner of U.S. Route 9, which is here, and Stanford Court. Um, the lot was created by subdivision in 1988 and um, 
In 2009, the town changed its zoning and the setback requirements for siting a uh, house on the property. Uh, on this plan, in the dark line, is the building envelope, which is available for this two plus acre piece of property uh, to put a house, um, utilizing the latest uh, setback requirements, yard requirements <coughs> from the town of Rhinebeck zoning. I've also shown on the uh, plan uh, in a dash line the yards and the, the resulting building envelope um, which existed prior to the 2009 zoning changes. And um, the plan also shows proposed single family dwelling which uh, has a square footage <coughs> that um, just exceeds the minimum requirements uh, of the declaration of restrictions that was placed on the entire subdivision uh, back when it was created. So you can see that this 2,000 square foot house, uh, you, you can't, there's really no place to put it um, without getting some sort of variances. And the variances we're requesting are only two. One is that um, the front yard setback, this is a corner lot, so there's two front yards setback requirements. Um, we're requesting that the, uh, pro the, the, the pre-2009 change uh, front yard setback be uh, allowed for this particular uh, lot, uh, which is 50 feet rather than the 100 feet which would, is, is this line right here for, for the setback from Stanford Court and from uh, US Route 9. <coughs> um, the 2009 zoning uh, side or rear, depending on which way you look at this, uh, yard is shown here, um, which is 50 feet. The one, uh, the same yard or setback line uh, for the, pre-2009 uh, zoning is uh, 25 feet, and we're requesting a relaxation from uh, 50 to 47 feet in order to get this house to fit on the property uh, in such a manner that it blends in uh, and, and fits in with the topography. Um, the existing lot uh, has a, an approved sewage disposal system, the approval for which remains in effect. It expires in June of uh, 2019. Similarly, the well location is set as part of the original subdivision uh, with the appropriate extensions which have been made throughout the years. Well, that's basically it. Ah, there's one other thing. Another um, addition to the town code, uh, I think it was in 2012. This is the can't be sure about it. Yeah. Uh, let's see. No, that was 2009 also. Uh, it was a creation of a uh, wetland uh, setback. Uh, this wetland was delineated by uh, ecological solutions and surveyed in. Um, and <coughs> the resulting 100 foot setback puts the setback line for that uh, wetland, small strip of wetland there and back here also. So basically that's what we're here for tonight to request the variance from for two of the yard requirements. Okay. Um, by the way, just for the record, on um, looks like November 19th, uh, you sent to us uh, the renderings of the house and I appreciate that. Um, oh, yeah. So it, well, we I had it, but I just didn't know when, when you said um, rendering. I I started. I know. I started to shake a little right. bit. Yeah. <laughs> but if that's appropriate and that that, that satisfies, so it isn't going to look like some sort of a you know hot dog stand. Right. Well, it, it, one of the considerations we have, if in considering a variance, right, is that we have to see if 
if it's going to affect the neighborhood, if it's going to affect the neighborhood in a good or bad way, and seeing what the thing looks like, and then comparing it to what's in the neighborhood is is very very helpful for that. So yeah, yeah and I, I just uh, just to kind of lid on the whole thing, hopefully, um, <coughs> this is um, the same drawing with the, with the house located with the driveway, um, but this is. Uh, an aerial photo, uh, which I got from the state GIS system, the county also has it. And if you go out there, this is the um, the, the um, tree line and the, uh, the the rock area here. So the house is going to be sitting behind that. Um, at one point in time, there was somebody was thinking about putting it out here, mm -hmm. but that would be like shooting yourself in the foot. Um, so I really don't think that the impact is going to be uh, significant for the travelers on Route 9. Um, as we discussed last month, uh, we've, we've oriented the, um, uh, the house so that the garage doesn't face the street. Um, just like this one over here, the existing house. By the way, the setback here is 58 feet, more or less, and this, this is a very, very appropriate for Right, and we consider that because uh, you know, in other neighborhoods like Sapasco Village, you, you have uh, existing houses that don't meet the current right. guidelines. So we, we look into that. Yep. And uh, that uh, this is very helpful, and it does look like from the tree line, you're not going to be able to see it from Route Nine, especially with the leaves on right. and all that I kind might of stuff. See the, might see the roof. Yeah. And uh, you said there's deed restrictions, a uh, minimum of 2,000 square foot. Yeah, it's a little over 2,000, and right. the declarations say that if you have a one story, it has to be at least 2,000. So okay. we didn't want to put a try and go with a bigger one because then we would probably have to ask for more mm -hmm. a relaxation of the setbacks. And um, so we didn't want to do <clears throat> Okay. And you're flipping the blueprints? Yeah, it's just a uh, mirror image. Yep. I hope that didn't confuse you. Questions, concerns? No. Nothing? No? And nobody in the audience um, is here for this application or has any questions, concerns? This is the opportunity. Um, I do note that we got a referral from the uh, planning board and they find that the area variances raise no significant planning or environmental issues according to them. And um, that was in a document dated uh, December 18th, 2018. Um, also, it looks like the um, CAB and WAC um, didn't feel that there was any issue as well, and that's by letter dated November 27th, 2018. Okay, I don't have any um, questions, concerns, comments. Um, makes sense to me, I understand what you're asking for. Um, again, last chance. Uh, Tim and I are going to go out there and do a site visit. Okay. Uh, Just tell you, if, is uh, Thursday the 3rd of January good? There's, walk over yeah. There's a calendar of uh, January. That's a Thursday, maybe 10 a.m., if that's good. Uh, January when? 3rd. Sure. Okay. Well, one last thing is, is it uh, staked? The, the house? Yeah, the general outline of the house. No. Could it be? Because that's helpful. So when we go out there, we see the general, you know, where it's going to be. Just stakes in the general area. Of, we, could, we could have a stake. Yeah, that, that's very helpful. We usually ask for that, too, because okay. just looking at the bare ground, yeah, I you, you get an idea, but... Yeah, where, where am I? Yeah, where, where exactly? Where is it exactly? Yeah. All right, so that's 10 a.m. on the third. Yep. Okay. Good. Thank you. Okay. Great. Okay. Um, at this point in time, I'd make a motion uh, to close the public hearing. Do I have a second? Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Right. Great. And Richard, you're assigned to it, right? Yep. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a nice holiday. You too.
Okay. Uh, the next and last uh, public hearing is um, on the Goomer Hollow application. And um, I assume we have folks in the audience. You're here for that? Okay. Um, what we're going to do here is um, we first have the applicant come up, explain uh, what the request is, uh, what they're trying to do, and what the situation is. Then we ask that if you want to make a comment, if you could come up to the microphone, state your name, state your address, and ask whatever questions, state whatever concerns you have for the record. Okay? So uh, applicants, come on up. Keep your voice up, so, and so Fred can get you. Fred, if you're having problems with the sound, let me know. Let us know. Um, hey, good evening. I'm Jeff Irish. I'm uh, uh, with a company called Sun Common, formerly called Hudson Solar. We're um, uh, the largest uh, solar design and installation company in the Hudson Valley. Um, we are being uh, contracted uh, by Mike DeCola and Goomer Hollow um, LLC to uh, design and build a rooftop community solar array on um, an, uh, an existing hay barn and two uh, livestock shelter buildings on his property um, on, the, on the west side of town. So uh, this is an application. Um, for interpretation regarding a letter from the ZEO um, that she issued on uh, 23 October uh, of this year um, regarding the requirement for screening uh, a rooftop community solar system or solar farm. Um, uh, she seemed to indicate that the law, um, in her opinion, um, required screening of it and we're in front of this board um, requesting that you review that and um, obviously uh, decide otherwise. So uh, first of all, um, the Town of Rhinebeck solar zoning law is a relatively new law. Um, it was passed last year. Um, solar uh, in about the middle of the year. Um, solar is an evolving field. It's a new industry. Um, community solar is particularly new in New York State. Um, it was uh, uh, made possible by a Public Service Commission order in July of 2015. Um, uh, New York is following other states. Um, the purpose of community solar is to allow uh, people who cannot site solar on their property to be able to benefit from um, from solar energy and the savings uh, that it can offer, as well as to expand the use of solar because uh, the planet, basically the planet needs it. Um, uh, we have to stop burning fossil fuels uh, in order to generate our electricity, and solar is becoming the most popular way um, to stop doing that. So uh, the law was issued uh, in mid-2017, as I said. Um, being a new law in a new field, uh, it, it's uh, now it, the first projects that are um, um, uh, applicable to it, especially the solar farm section, are just you know now and for the last year or so uh, moving through the, uh, the planning and zoning. Um, processes. So we think that um, the town was pretty clear in its intention when it um, issued the solar zoning law, when it wrote it, um, but that in the process of writing a new law in a, uh, that covers a technically complicated field, there are some, um, some things that were 
um, words that may have been left out um, in certain places and there's some room for interpretation still. So uh, what I'd like to do is um, I'm going to go through the reasons why we think uh, this particular project should not be screened. But first of all, should I just present maybe an overview of what we're yeah, talking about? Yeah, I think about? an overview okay. would be good for everybody in the audience. Right. And um, can everybody see? Okay. Okay. Uh, what we're talking here is a rather large parcel between Morton Road and Mill Road. How large is it? It's 650 acres. Um, there's an equestrian uh, facility that's on the property. Um, the Decolas live there. Jamie uh, and Mike uh, live there. And um, what Mike uh, is in the process of doing is developing a section of the east side of the property to be um, uh, basically a, f a fairly uh, modern um, organic livestock uh, uh, farming area. And um, he could uh, probably explain it better and I think it's worth him doing that because the, s the solar systems on the rooftops um, the, uh, are integral to the uh, viability, the financial viability of the farming concept that he's um, that he's working on here. Want to talk about it? Hi. Um, so there are these two long shade sheds that are oriented to provide maximum amount of shade cover for animals, and that also makes them um, very valuable to collect solar energy as well. Um, the idea for this started almost a decade ago when I started um, doing some study work on uh, grazing in mixed forest areas. And there's a lot of studies that show how cattle and other grazing animals, their, their productivity increases when they have access to shade. And they have access to shade in ways that are integral to them moving across grazing areas. It's very technical, um, but there's a lot of science that the cattle do better if they do have access to shade throughout the day. Um, so when we were talking about clearing this section of the property and returning it to grazing land, um, the idea of having some kind of silvopasture or shading there was something we'd always been talking about. Um, as the price of solar energy uh, equipment went down, the idea of integrating shade shelters and the cattle grazing became more and more interesting. The limiting factor for most people of installing man-made shade is the cost of the buildings. So we figured out that either by using the power on the farm, or in this case even allowing us to sell it to other families, uh, we could make these buildings very cost effective and get the productivity gains that the grazing with shade would provide and also cut down on the cost of the buildings. So that's how the, the idea began. Um, I've worked with soil and water conservation to come up with a farm plan for this area and talked about the design of these buildings with their uh, technicians and everybody was pretty excited about the idea. Um, it's new. Uh, what we're hoping to do is have the animals graze uh, in a circular pattern through these fields having access to shade throughout the year, the grazing year. So they'll move up the field and back down and up this way and end up over here where we can process them. And they'll always have access to shade and we'll have the water set up in a way that they're moving back and forth across the field between water and shade to maximize the grazing. Um, so that's the farm plan. Uh, 
we knew that we could use for our existing uh, agricultural uses a significant amount of power. But then New York State passed this community solar plan and we actually started talking about this with our friends. We have about 10 people that we know in the town who own a home, but their roofs don't face the right direction. They can't put it on their house because there's trees there. And this idea of being able to co-op a solar installation and allow people to get the benefit of solar power from this kind of installation and not have to put it on their home seemed really attractive. So that's what generated our interest and this plan. So, pretty much fill it out. Okay. All right, and the controversy is if you only use the solar power for agricultural purposes, so, screening is not required. Is, here's the interesting thing about screening. But, but if you are selling it, it to, to so, other folks, that's so, where the law comes in and says. So the law, the law allows for roof-mounted systems to be put up without any of this, without any planning board issues, in every instance except the community solar. And I believe it's an oversight. I believe the community solar law was written with the idea that these panels would all be out here in the fields, which they are in some places, and that to screen them makes sense. But if you look at the resource of buildings, this, we're getting maybe a little bit ahead of ourselves, but I don't think anybody intended you to have to screen roofs. And I think that's why we're talking about it being unreasonable. When we did a very expensive visual impact study for the planning board uh, with a proposal for an existing hedge and improving it. And we all talked about with our neighbors whether the hedge would be thick enough or high enough at different times of the year. In none of the pictures that anybody developed, these visual impact guys developed, are the roofs obscured. Because you can't. We'd have to plant a forest to obscure the roofs. And there was a lot of discussion about screening and the depth of the screening and how much screening. And in every instance where we talked about it, you can still see the panels on the roof. At the end of the visual impact analysis that the town did of our visual impact study, the guy says that, I mean, I could, I could read it for you. Um, that because the panels are in the same uh, angle as the roof, and they're only six inches off of it, or up to eight inches off of it, that the only change in the visual impact of the area is the color of the roof. Now, hopefully, for all of us, for our world, these are going to be on roofs all over the place in the next 20 years. In California, you have to put these on your roofs. Because we need this. Now if we say that the visual impact of putting a solar panel on your roof, or putting a lot of solar panels on your roof, of a commercial building, requires that you screen the roof, that crosses the line to what I think is unreasonable. Because if we look around our town at all the roofs that someone could see and say, I don't like the way that looks. So then you have to screen a roof from some being able to see it. Seems unreasonable to me. Uh, we went through a very expensive prospect Pro, um, process of figuring out how we could keep this hedge. And I did that because I felt like we needed to do that. Part of our responsibility as a neighbor for the farm activities. Now the interesting thing about the farm law is that it requires that if you're in an agricultural district 
and you own an adjacent house to, to farming activity, you have to put in the screening. It's not even our responsibility to do it. The ag law says that if you build a home in an ag district, you have to screen the agricultural activity so that this discussion can't happen. But we're willing to entertain the process of screening because the law asked us to. But as we went through the process of having a professional mock-up photos of what the visual impacts would be, there's not a single photo where the roof gets screened. The buildings may or may not be screened, but you can't screen the roofs. So to me, it's unreasonable to ask for that. So I'll, I'll continue a little bit uh, further about um, what this project will look like. So uh, these two buildings are the shade structures here and here. Um, they would have solar panels on their roofs. And this is a hay barn and it would have solar panels on it, its roof as well. Um, the size of the system uh, is about 26,000 square feet of solar panels. Um, Rhinebeck's solar zoning law requires that the surface area of the solar panels be less than 36,000 square feet. Um, that, uh, so we're compliant with that. Um, that limit, by the way, is extremely small uh, in, in uh, community solar. 98% of all community solar projects that are in development in the state of New York right now are um, start at uh, five times this size. So this is already a very small community solar system. So this drawing, when I handed out these to the board last time, uh, this indicates how the, the solar panels are actually mounted on the roof. Um, they are mounted parallel to the roof surfaces. Uh, these, the metal roofs as they exist right now are green, um, um, gr painted green uh, steel roofs. The solar panels are mounted parallel uh, at a maximum height of about six and a half inches above the, uh, the surface of the roof. Um, Town of Rhinebeck requires it to be less than eight inches, so we're compliant that way. It also requires that um, the solar panels not uh, extend beyond either the lower ridge or the upper ridge of the roof, and we're compliant that way too. Um, part of the challenge here on the screening as we were going through the planning board, and they were wondering if it was necessary, is that the, um, the hay barn at its peak is 29 feet high. Um, the shade structures are 24 feet high. So you've got solar panels which um, at their maximum point are you know about 24 to 29 feet high and as Mike said I mean that's where the the, the uh, challenge uh, becomes extreme as to whether or not you can uh, screen those year-round. Okay so I've got um, pictures that were from the visual impact study that our consultant did for the planning board. Um, I'll just pass those down here. There's kind of a before and after um, picture of, of each building from the roadway, um, Mill Road. Um, the first set looking at this pair of buildings to the south and the second set looking at this single building up to the north. Um, and I mean basically what you see uh, is you see green metal roofs that when the solar panels are mounted on them uh, become blue <laughs> looking and they have a kind of a, a slight framework texture from the aluminum uh, rails of the of the solar modules. Um, at the last uh, meeting I think uh, one of the meetings I guess it was uh, I'm not sure if it was this board or the planning board. We've been, been in front of the planning board so many times but someone asked about the glare from the solar panels. Um, there, the glare of solar panels has been widely studied um, by the FAA because there are um, uh, there's uh, a, a strong desire to put solar panels on the fields surrounding airports, um, and one of the 
um, best examples is the Denver airport. If you've ever flown into Denver, um, there are huge solar arrays around the Denver airport. And the FAA has studied it extensively. Um, the uh, solar panels are made of anti-reflective glass. Um, the solar systems are expensive, so there's an awful lot of engineering work that's gone into the chemistry and the crystalline structure of the glass on solar panels so that the light is absorbed into this and passed through the glass to the silicon cells beneath it instead of reflected back up to the atmosphere. And um, solar panels uh, typically reflect about 2% of the light that strikes them, the sunlight that strikes them. Um, to put it in comparison, um, uh, a brand new metal roof, Galvalume metal roof on a steel building reflects about 65%, 68% of the sunlight. So, uh, and then after the roof ages, it, it, the paint begins to dull and it reflects about 55%. And um, so we're talking about uh, roofs that metal roofs such as this that would normally reflect 55% of the sunlight, uh, you put solar panels on them, they'll reflect 2%. So if you have a metal roof and you're concerned about its, uh, the glare from it, the best thing you can do is put solar panels on it. So, and I have a, a sheet um, on that that cites the FAA studies and um, I'll pass that out to the board too. Just a couple of those. Um, so, um, uh, getting back to the the appeal. Um, so this this has been in front of the planning board. There was some question about the um, screening um, of the solar panels. Uh, Mike. Uh, I think very graciously offered to um, uh, uh, let grow and also extend the existing hedgerow that runs along Mill Road and then also go ahead and maintain it because to maintain a hedgerow requires a lot of work. There's a certain way to cut it. You have to cut it on a triangle to let the, let, the light get at it. You have to uh, keep the large trees out of it. Um, you have to uh, be concerned about the invasive species. Um, and so he proposed maintain, improving that hedgerow and um, enhancing it and then maintaining it um, in order to help with the visual impact. But what came out was that you just can't screen a roof. Um, and, and some of the questions became, well, what happens when the leaves come off the hedgerow in the winter? Will we be able to see the buildings in the roof then? And it, it, um, I think at that point is when the planning board said, well, is there even a requirement to screen it? Because I don't think the solar uh, zoning law is clear. And um, they requested the ZEO rule on it. She made her opinion, and now that's what we're appealing. So um, I'm now, I'd like to now go through the solar zoning law and just explain why um, I think sh uh, she was in error in that ruling, if that's okay. That's fine, but I do want to give the opportunity to the, the folks here to voice their, their opinions as well. So, yeah, if you could just uh, give us a brief over, okay. overview of uh, be all right. your argument. Okay. So, um, first of all, the, the solar zoning law states that uh, the use of solar energy is to be strongly encouraged um, within the town of Rhinebeck. Um, Rhinebeck uh, wants to be a climate smart community consistent with the, the town's uh, current and long-term sustainability agenda and um, they declared that it's uh, it both necessary and a priority component for the town of Rhinebeck going forward. So the solar zoning law is then split roughly into three sections. There's a section that talks about um, rooftop systems, residential, commercial, and agricultural where the usage is only for the, um, the site. Then there's a section on ground mount systems, then there's a section on um, solar farms. And in the rooftop section of the solar zoning law, um, uh, the law states that basically rooftop solar systems are permitted in almost every zoning district in the town. Um, 
and without any requirement whatsoever for screening or for um, or uh, any concern of visual impact. The only uh, issues with regard to visual impact for rooftop systems are the ones that I mentioned earlier, that they be mounted parallel to the roof surface, uh, that they not extend beyond the roof surface, um, and that they be within eight inches of the roof surface. But other than that, you are free to put rooftop solar panels anywhere. Um, and if, as, if Mike was doing this, uh, uh, for his own use for the farm, he could put up a 4,000 square foot system or about half of one of the long buildings. He could cover that in solar panels and not even have to go to the planning board or the zoning board. It would just uh, it, it'd be a permitted use and he'd be issued a building permit. Um, the issue becomes that this is a solar farm. So then um, there's the ground mount section of the solar zoning law where there's a lot of talk about screening and about aesthetics um, and that kind of thing. And then finally there's the solar farm section, uh, section I. So um, in section I, I think the issue and where the, the zoning enforcement officer made her mistake was that the law, uh, the way it's written, um, sometimes refers to rooftop, sometimes uh, refers to ground, and sometimes doesn't refer to any. And um, many of the clauses in section I um, don't refer to roof, they don't refer to ground, but they clearly only apply to uh, ground-mounted systems where most of the concern in the law is with, with about aesthetics. So I-1 talks about the um, 36,000 square foot issue, which I said, I know, uh, pointed out we're compliant with. Um, section 2, uh, I-2, then talks about a fee-owned parcel. Uh, it doesn't mention roof, it doesn't mention ground, but clearly, um, if you're talking about it being the principal use on a, uh, a fee-owned parcel, it can only be talking about ground. Otherwise, if there was a building on it, a roof, there'd already be some other use. Um, I-3 talks again about a leased, of uh, being a co-principal use on a leased site. Again, it doesn't mention roof, it doesn't mention ground. Um, and then um, I-4 talks about um, uh, minimum lot um, and, and area and bulk regulations, again, not talking about roof, not talking about ground. Um, but clearly, when it's talking about the setbacks and things, it's, it's referring to a ground-mounted system um, rather than a system for a, a already permitted building that's, a, that's already there. Um, I-5 um, talks about uh, um, it being located in a residential district, so they permit solar farms in residential districts. Um, there's no mention about screening. In I-6, they talk about a roof. Um, and here, um, it's uh, specifically, it, it specifically points out something about roof. It's talking about the minimum lot area requirements and some of the bulk air, uh, regulations and the minimum size of, of a lot, but it specifically uh, is referring to roof. The next section, I-7, is talking about encroaching on ecologically sensitive land. So that section is obviously talking about ground, but it doesn't mention ground. Um, obviously a rooftop system on an existing building would not be encroaching on any ecologically sensitive land or water resource. Uh, I-8, again, also talks about um, uh, uh, neither, neither roof nor ground, but it refers to cutting of trees and cutting of forests. So again, a rooftop system, um, you wouldn't be cutting forests down for a rooftop system. Um, and again, so it's, it's referring to ground without actually mentioning ground. Section 9 is all on fencing. Um, it does say that ground-mounted systems have to be um, enclosed by fences. Uh, <coughs> Section 10 talks about agricultural uses without mentioning roof or ground. Um, Section 11 then talks about um, the fence perimeter, or the area within um, uh, a solar farm. 
um, not having tamped ground. And it doesn't mention if that's for a rooftop system or a ground mount system, but again, it's obviously referring to ground. So the point of me bringing this up is I think that there was, there were a lot of clauses in section I that were written referring to ground without specifically saying ground. Um, then we come to uh, I-14, which is actually the one that the zoning enforcement officer was referring to. And here it's talk, starting to talk about um, existing and natural vegetation um, to help screen a solar plant from use. It doesn't mention roof, it doesn't mention ground, but we believe that the intent was that uh, the law was talking again about ground. And that's, I think, further demonstrated in I-15, where it says the maximum height of the top edge of any solar panel shall be 12 feet above ground level when the panel is oriented at its maximum vertical tilt. So. Uh, the law doesn't mention roof, it doesn't mention ground. If we were to read that section, I-15, and interpret it um, directly, it would mean that you can't put solar panels on a roof because you, they'd have to be less than 12 feet high. So again, there are sections of, uh, parts of section I were written referring to ground, but they didn't mention um, ground. And I don't think that they, by not mentioning ground meant that it should include roof. And then um, and after that there's just some things about decommissioning, uh, about outdoor lighting and things like that. So um, I think that um, the law is unclear um, and I understand maybe how the zoning enforcement officer made her conclusion but I think that the intent of the law and, and elsewhere throughout the law it's pretty clear that there was no intention to have to screen rooftop solar systems, and I think that um, requiring it to do so um, would be counter to the intent of the law and what the town was trying to achieve. Okay. Thank you. Okay, uh, members of the audience, uh, do you want to be heard? And if so, uh, please come on up, state your name, your address and speak clearly and state your concerns or if you have questions and actually maybe before i even get to that i just want to note for the record we had we received two letters um one was a and they're part of the record uh from uh mr donaldson uh dated november 16th 2018 uh setting forth multiple concerns and also a letter forwarded by mr donaldson uh, from david and valerie uh, Schaff, I hope I'm pronouncing their names correctly, dated December 19th, 2018. They could not be here, but uh, their concerns are, are, are set forth in a letter which will again be, part, be made part of the record. So, with that, brother? Ragucci? Ragusa. It was on uh, November 10th, and oh, then okay. there was another one from uh, Hannah Barrett on uh, December 14th. Okay. Am I correct? Yes. Yeah. You should also have two letters coming from Joey Milstein. I'm sorry, different, different application. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Sure. Uh, why don't you give it to Chris? She's our clerk. Yes, uh, please, If uh, whoever wants to be heard, come on up, state your name, your address, and whatever questions you have for the applicants or whatever concerns you have about the project, now is your time to uh, be heard. I'm Cliff Schubert, and I live across the street diagonally from Mr. Nicola's um, electric generating plant, I guess I can refer to it. I just have one or two questions, yeah, can I ask you? Across the street from my agricultural plant. Okay. Uh, well, let, let's not get into semantics. Just if you could ask the, uh, yeah. the question. And what, what is your address, by the way? 291 Mill Road. Okay, thank you. Okay. Now, I want to get out of the way of this to ask my question, because I'd like to ask you if you could show us an earlier diagram, the area or location. Can you hear him? Excuse, excuse we, we, we need to, we need we to need hear to you. Speak into the mic for the record. Okay. And you should also just address the All right, board. My question is, could you uh, put up the earlier diagram and point out the location of the screening that you referred to that you were going to maintain? <clears throat> so, 
So all along Mill Road from Eastgate Drive here uh, to the end of my property line, which is, I would say it's probably three quarters of a mile, um, there is an existing hedgerow that is quite thick in some spots and sparse in others where there have been large trees in the past. Uh, most of the trees along this line uh, were ash trees or elm and have died in the last 15 or 20 years. There are some that we have kept, but each place where there was a large tree, <clears throat> the hedge is sparse. So when we prepared our um, visual impact study, we took a section of the hedge that is been in sunlight and maintained. I have a, a verge mowing machine that goes on a tractor that can cut the top and the front of the hedge over the last five or six years that's representative of what the hedge will look like when it has been given sunlight and care for some years. Um, I think the hedge across the street from Mr. Schubert's house had on it a very large uh, maple tree that was taken down by the town either this past year or two years ago and it is quite sparse where you live. But there are parts farther down and before his house that are thicker. And it's all along the roadside here, along the ditch edge. What, what material is that hedge? What it is a mixture of uh, multiflora rose, honeysuckle, um, there's dogwood, there are small deciduous trees that have grown into the hedge that we encourage to stay horizontal by clipping the top. There's um, uh, grape. It's so, your, so your intent though is to have the hedge be what height? Um, it is easy to mow it at about seven foot. And by, by mowing it, it encourages it to fill out. Uh, and in the areas where we've been able to do that, uh, where there were, weren't large trees in the air, that has happened. I've kept an area, which we talked about at the planning board, all the way down on the other end of the property that was a large open field that had grown up in this same hedge material. And I um, mowed it in, in rows so it's sitting horizontal to sunlight so that I can then take sections of that nursery and move it into the sparse areas. That was my plan at least. Uh, but that's where the hedge is, along the road right here. But in your uh, visual impact study, there was never a, um, a rendering that was done that considered other material? other material than what's over there? Yeah, that, yeah, that would be taller. So, these are very long buildings. Yeah. And this is a very long roadway. So, to install a hedge of a different material would be prohibitively expensive. As would installing mature trees that would screen a roof. It would make it impossible. And to that, I would say that um, we can, as, as, as Jeff said, we can use a significant portion of the roof already for our farm activities. I think that if we ran into a wall in this process of trying to get a permit for community solar, we would find other electrical uses on the property for agricultural uses that we could then fill out this roof. It's a resource we want to use. And the law is pretty clear about us being able to do that. <coughs> I don't say that as a threat. It's the reality of what we have. 
And there's no screening requirement for that at all. All the buildings are already up, yes? The buildings are up. We're, I, I should have looked this up before, and so I apologize for not having done it, but... Um, could you just remind me where these are in relation to the whole 600 and some, some acres, like where the rest of the land goes? Uh, somewhere around the island. So the, this is the north, sorry, the southeast corner of the property. Um, uh, the Sherrod McLaughlin farm sits just about up here. Mill Road runs down and around, and our property line starts there. The Mill Road runs down and around, past here. This is about halfway down Mill Road on the property to the uh, meeting of Morton Road. There's a small schoolhouse there that's about an acre that's not part of the farm. And then it runs all the way around back to basically the first house in Rhinecliff. Michael, I have a picture of the partial access, if you mind. Oh, oh. Oh, sure. that would be that'd, that'd be great. Thank you. So, um, let's see. this is actually strangely stretched. Uh, okay. The, the property is a little bit wider this way. Okay. But this field here uh -huh. is where the buildings are. Okay. okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, do we have other members of the uh, public who would like to be heard? Um, good evening. My name is Robert Donaldson. I live at 307 Mill Road. Now, when Mr. DeCola and, and Suncom submitted this application uh, for the installation of this roof mounted solar panels back to the planning board back in July, I submitted an outline response that I submitted to the ZBA for the November meeting. And in that outline response, I gave all of the regulatory policies found in the comprehensive plan, the scenic area of statewide significance, the local waterfront revitalization program, as well as the town codes that direct the issue towards required screening. All right. For the October planning board meeting, I submitted a response rebuttal to Sun Commons visual analysis report and some of the comments presented by Mr. Irish here and Mr. DeCola about the screening along Mill Road are addressed in that rebuttal, including current pictures, all right? And then for this meeting tonight, I submitted another response rebuttal to Sun Commons response about their um, contesting the ZEO's uh, ruling on the required screening. So I hope you had time to take a look at those outlines. And I do have a brief response tonight, and I ask if any of the members of the ZBA have any questions about those three outlines. If you'd like to ask them now, I'd be happy to try to address them. I think, did, Mr. Donaldson, this is your letter. May I come over? In yeah. November 16th. Yeah. My that's okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. Right. Okay. And there should be a couple of others. One, which is an extensive outline on all of the regulatory policies. That includes pictures, both of the summer and the winter scenes that were submitted back at the um, November meeting. So the I, I went through both. I, I don't have any questions. Okay. Um, before I begin, um, Mr. Bergen, I, before in the other applicant, the previous uh, agenda item, you made reference to the CAB WA, WAC submitting a report. By any chance, are you looking at the WAC 
report that was submitted to the planning board back at the July meeting by any chance? I wasn't talking about this application. I, I was talking about the application previous to this. Previous to yes, this. you mentioned a uh, WAC report, a consistency review. By any chance in this um, application, are you looking at the WAC consistency review? I, I, I don't know that we have that. Well, it's a refer, uh, this application before us right now is for an interpretation. Okay. Yeah, and I so don't, there, I don't know that it's required. Okay, to, yeah. It's, yeah, I don't think any like referrals were done. It's not like the planning board, like where they are going to read. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, then. All right. All right. To begin with, uh, I want to inform the board that I'm not opposed to having solar panels installed on the roofs of the uh, barns and hay, and the hay structure on the property. In fact, I'm really in favor of such renewable sources of energy, and my God, we definitely do need it. But I'm in favor of it as long as it complies with town codes and regulatory policies. Now, Mr. DeCola mentioned before about the onus for screening is really on the property owners across the street from his property there, all right, to screen out agricultural activities. Well, that's not the case here, all right? Solar panels, even though you might hear the term solar farm or harvesting solar power, is not an agricultural activity. The grazing of animals, those buildings providing shade, and any other the, uh, of the services provided for the animals on the farm are agricultural activities well, or agricultural equipment. I contacted Bob Somers up at the Agricultural Markets Office in Albany, and he vacillated back and forth. Finally, I, I posed a question to him. Would you please cite me the New York State codified law or court decision, preferably on the Court of Appeals level, that says that gathering, harvesting solar power or solar power, you know, roof-mounted solar power panels is an agricultural activity. And after a few moments, he said, no, there isn't any law or any court case. It's not an agricultural activity. There are ways that it can become an agricultural activity, but right now as it stands, those roof-mounted solar panels are not an agricultural activity or agricultural equipment. Therefore, Mr. DeCola's idea, his statement saying that the property owners have to provide the screening, that's a baseless argument. It doesn't apply. Because they are not an agricultural activity, they require a special use permit and therefore to be in compliance with town codes and regulatory policies, he has to provide the required screening. Now, the applicant, Mr. Cola, has expressed that being required to plant the screening would block the view of the roof-mounted solar panels from Mill Road, it would be too much of a burden for the operation of his agricultural activities on his farm. I, I disagree with that. In reality, the applicant, along with Suncommon's actions from the onset and the duration of this whole process, actually created the burdensome conditions. To begin with, when the applicant planned these structures, they were designed to accommodate the livestock that would use such for shade, but as well as to provide for roof-mounted solar panels. However, when the buildings were approved, the solar panel codes had not been enacted, and only the structures were approved. Yet, there were regulatory policies in, in effect, policies found in the scenic area of statewide significance and within the town's local waterfront revitalization program that mandated such screening for projects that would present discordant view sheds along the scenic roads in this area. Now, the Goomer Hollow Farm is located in a scenic area of statewide significance, as well as in within the town's LWRA. The structures are situ also situated along a designated scenic road by New York State and by the town and are clearly visible to those who use as well as reside there. Yet the applicant in Sun Common chose to ignore the regulatory policies that require screening to block out the scoring features along the view shed from the road and adjac adjacent properties. There are 538 acres on this, on this parcel. 138 of those acres are used for agricultural activities, leaving 400 other acres where the applicant could have placed those structures. In fact, had the applicant moved these structures, all right, the shade structures here and the barn, 100 yards in on the property, 
there would have been sufficient screenings there in the trees that would indicate the need, all right, to be here tonight or before the planning board, all right, taking up everybody's time. But he chose, no, he chose to place them right here along a designated scenic road, and therefore, he presented the burden on himself, not the town code, all right? Had those, when the town enacted the solar panel codes, along with the required screening, the applicant chose to ignore those as well. He went ahead and had those structures built and even removed trees that could have provided some screening that would have negated the need to um, apply the law to this. Deliberately ignoring town codes and regulatory policies that are in place to prevent discordant view sheds from along our scenic roads is not an affirmative reason or justification to overrule or modify the ZEO's ruling on this matter. Ruling in favor of this application would establish a dangerous precedent that could have lasting negative effects for all the designated scenic roads in this town. Right? Matter of fact, there are 15 additional scenic roads throughout this town. Upholding the CEO's ruling is both the legal and the right way to address this matter. I mention that it's the right way to address this matter because I refer to a report found on the Scenic Hudson website, a report titled Clean Energy, Green Communities, a guide to citing renewable energy in the Hudson Valley, a report in which Mr. Jeff Irish at Hudson Solar at that time contributed his professional input. The report states, and I quote, new solar projects should not result in significant negative impact to scenic views and vistas, including designated scenic areas of statewide significance and scenic byways, like designated scenic road, mill road, that it is. Site design should include appropriate setbacks and vegetative screening to minimize and, and mitigate any visual impact. Su such planting should comply with the following recommendations. Be large enough to screen the facility from the time of its installation. Be selected to provide year-round screening. Enhance the area's existing beauty and provide long-lived, resilient, and dense bank of vegetation. I, along with my neighbor sitting over there from Mill Road here tonight, join Mr. Ar join Mr. Irish with these recommendations and ask the CBA to uphold the CEO's ruling. Thank you. Thank you. Can I respond to you, Certainly. <clears throat> so, I, I believe Mr. Donaldson's made my case in a certain way. Um, clearly, the issue that everyone has is with the buildings. And the buildings <coughs> are absolutely legal and they're as of right. What I feel is unreasonable is that by adding a different colored roof and eight inches of height, that all of that should be required. And I don't think that's what the law intended. So there's no question that the buildings can be there without screening. But by changing the color of the roof, I am now in this world. Because that's really what we're talking about. I've spoken at length at planning board meetings and submitted lengthy reports. In none of my reports do I argue or contest the buildings. The buildings are there. They are agriculturally exempt. In all my reports, I talked about the solar panels on the roof. We're talking about 25,000 square feet of solar panels that are not an agricultural activity. So Mr. when Mr. Cola says we keep arguing about the, um, the structures, we're not. They're there. Matter of fact, I don't mind them too much right now. But solar panels, no. Put the screening in. Or, as he should have done from the beginning, move them in 100 yards. And we would have been all home tonight getting ready for Christmas.
Hello, I'm Hello. Hannah Barrett. Um, I live at 317 Mill Road with my wife, Laurel Sparks, also present. Uh, we're a fairly new uh, residents of Rhinebeck. We uh, closed on 317 in September of 2017. And we are also here in support of and out of gratitude for this interpretation, which we were very pleased about because uh, it mentioned uh, screening this solar array with uh, deciduous and coniferous trees. Um, I submitted photos to you um, from the view of the sheds out of the windows of our house showing the rooftops that are going to have these solar arrays and I agree with this ruling that this would be a very effective way of screening the solar panels. Um, there are uh, multiple examples that come to mind up and down Mill Road of residences that have used trees very effectively to screen single rows of trees. You can't see anything behind those trees. There are many examples in the neighborhood within easy driving distance of buildings screened by trees, and I think this would be a very effective way of screening um, what's going to be a very large solar utility right on our beautiful road, right opposite a whole bank of residential homes. Um, I'm happy to submit other examples, but I was very happy with this ruling. I'm in favor of upholding it. And I think that a mixture of trees is very effective screening. It doesn't block the roof, but you really, if you have a wall of trees, you can't see behind it. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. And this is part of the record, correct? Um, my name is Susan Ragusa. I um, moved into my home, 337 Mill Road, in 1991. The property across from my road was vacant, and a few years later, I don't remember exactly how many, Mr. DeCola purchased the property. And the east gate is directly opposite my home, and this is this is the shed that I view from my home. And I just want to add that I actually like the shed. I like the pastoral feel of it. So I've been happy for the last year and change looking at it. Perhaps a dozen years ago, after witnessing an awful lot of traffic into the East Gate on Mill Road, on one occasion I asked Mr. DeCola so what are your plans for the property? To which he replied, well, I, I'm going to be developing a mobile park. Um, well, I understand it's been a massive undertaking. And although I've only viewed a small part of Mr. DeCola's property from the East Gate Mill Road, what I did see for a time, goats were grazing along Mill Road cleaning up the brush, the weeds, and other unwanted plants, and by doing so, reducing the environmental footprint. Over the years, as I biked along Mill Road, towards Morton Road, the panoramic view of Michael DeCole's property became more spectacular over time. I recognize the DeColas as stewards taking on a collective responsibility by preserving and retaining the quality and biodiversity of their land, conserving those values, as I saw it, with love and respect. From the Decola's property to their recently um, built Ellerslie stables, the fields, woodlands, 
ponds and streams overlooking the Hudson River, groomed trails, paddocks, and jumping fields with gorgeous views. All of this was done with the most exacting details for perfection and excellence. As a beekeeper, I admire Mr. DeCoe's efforts to repopulate colonies of bees as they are collapsing, and with that, the pollination of vegetables and flowers in and around his property. Mr. and Mrs. DeCole's commitment as land stewards have been very gratifying to me. I understand and I recognize land, land stewardship is also a journey, and over time, there are commitments that need to be activated. And I believe it has been a privilege for the Decolas and their family to steward the land in the most magnificent way, abiding by environmental regulations, ensuring that they are in compliance with those guidelines, and using their resources responsibly, conserving some of those habitats, wildlife habitats on their property and in our community along Mill Road. And for that, I thank you. It is only now that I scratch my head and wonder why. Why the Decolas are not interested in continuing with the fundamentals of responsible stewardship they have long championed. Questioning the screening requirement asked of them by the town of Rhinebeck, a number of other regulations, and some of the neighbors on Mill Road, when in fact, it will not only help to screen the solar array, keeping the aesthetic of Mill Road a scenic road, as well as a neighboring residences, but also add to the existing beauty of Mr. and Mrs. DeCola's property. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. I should say that the mobile home park was a joke that I used to tell everybody when they asked me what I was doing with the property. Um, there are no current plans to build a mobile home. That's comforting. <laughs> um, do we have any other um, folks who want to be heard? Yeah, just a quick question. Sure. Uh, do you have and any if, if you could just get close, to, use the microphone just so Fred can get you on. Do you have any plans to build any other structures in the area that I'm about to point to? In here. Right, right up in here. That's the area that these structures are in. I know. Are you planning to build any more structures in this area? No, I don't have any plans to build any more structures to the north at this point. Okay. Um, so the, the question of how, where and how these buildings are located has come up a couple of times. Um, this is, in all of the 600 acres, the best area, the flattest area, to be able to do this kind of rotational grazing. So the siting of the buildings and the choice of the, of the area where we're doing this is dictated by the land. So <clears throat> I really appreciate your comments about stewardship. It's been very important to us. Um, and I do understand how it feels to have big changes happen across the street from where you live. Um, and I bring up the, the screening requirement of the Ag Law because it's important to understand these things in the context of what we're trying to do. Um, you know, that group of six homes that you guys are part of are all pre-existing non-conforming lots. Every house is in the wetland buffer. Um, they could never be built now. And I don't have any problem with you 
living and prospering and tending your lawn the way you want, clearing out your backyards to the stream. That's all your land. The fact that your houses are so close to the road is something that would not be permitted now. You would not be able to build there. That screening requirement is there to protect you. And it's not supposed to be a burden for the farmer. So I'm sorry that this ends up this way, but I point that out so the reality of the law is understood, not to try and put my thumb in your eye. Last January at the planning board meeting, so I'm talking January 2018, when Mr. DeCola presented his sketch plan to the planning board about the solar panels, Eric Blom, sitting right over where you are, sir, asked him, and I quote, how do your neighbors feel about it? To which Mr. DeCola responded, I spoke with some of my neighbors and they're fine with it. Well, he never spoke to any of us here on the road. Maybe he spoke to the people in town, you know, who he would like to, you know, sell the solar power to, or neighbors across the street. But he never spoke to us. And I think had he spoke to us, all right, maybe something could have been worked out. Something to avoid all of this acrimony and this debates before the planning board and the zoning board of appeals. But he chose not to. And he went ahead and chose to ignore the codes and put those structures where they are. I think if he had acted more responsibly and more as a good neighbor, we could have had a peaceful re resolution. I'm sorry, we did not ignore any codes. All these buildings have been built according to the town code, and we are here discussing the law because I believe there's a mistake in the law. You can have a different view but to represent that we have ignored codes and we have spent this amount of time and money here as well as you talking about them is really insulting. It's absolutely not true. Any other comments from um, either the applicant, applicant representative, the neighbors? Just, just one minute, because I found something that Mike uh, was trying to refer to earlier and he couldn't find. Um, the, the, we did do a visual impact study. Um, the town hired its own visual impact consultant, George Janes, to review our visual impact study. Um, his conclusion was, he said, final thought. He goes, the applicant is proposing small additions to the rooftops of existing buildings. It is unlikely that such small additions would have significant visual impacts as they do not increase the built area or, nor the building height by no more than eight inches. The texture and color of the rooftops will change, but those are not normally issues that require a visual impact analysis. So the town's own consultant didn't see a visual impact um, being created by putting rooftops on existing solar panels, on existing solar uh, buildings, sorry. Um, I ask to direct your attention to the second report that I submitted to you about the response to the Sun Common report regarding the town's um, independent visual analysis about it. Um, Mr. Jaynes basically said from the get-go of that report, he was only talking about <clears throat> the technical aspects, the equipment. And then in the end, he deviated, he also mentioned that you know, there should be the need for off-leaf winter pictures, which you didn't have. And I find that ironic because I submitted those pictures back in July, and here he is in October saying, well, they're not available. Yes, they were. But in the end, he did say that. You know, it's a small project. But he did that without consulting the regulatory policies or all the other information that had been submitted. All right, and remember, he said, I'm only talking about the technical aspects of this report. 
all right? And I think with that there, without the leaf off condition pictures, all right, it should be examined even more. Any other questions, comments, concerns? I don't want to go back and forth too many times here, but just to talk about what the system has proposed will provide. <clears throat> We're talking about 193 tons of carbon a year that this keeps from going up. Um, that's equivalent to what 65 homes use in fossil fuels. And as I said before, we get that by changing the color of the roof of existing buildings. And Bob's right. The solar panels themselves, that eight inches on the rooftop, is not an agricultural use. So you've got to ask yourself if that eight inches and the different color means that we're here. And that's what seems unreasonable to me. Thanks. Just speaking numbers, what's the value of the extra electricity that will be generated per year, estimated over what you use on the farm? In terms of what we'd be able to sell? Yes. Yeah. The value to you. About uh, $50,000 a year. Did you hear that? $50,000 a year. Okay. Well, that's, and that's the lifetime of those panels is 20 years? Is that what they're looking at these days? Yeah. Now that, you want to step up? And no. I want to, that's the retail value of the electricity that will be uh, generated. Yeah. That's not what he's going to get. Not. <laughs> okay. No, that's why, that's um, why I said value to him. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, the system is going to cost um, uh, on the order of like 800000 to to build. Um, uh, Mike and Jamie would get... Um, a fairly decent and steady return from that, like a 10, 12 percent annual return. So it's like taking that money out of, say, the stock market or some other investments and getting that kind of return for a 25 year period. And it's considered a very low risk return because it generates electricity within plus or minus 5 percent per year. Um, and uh, since prices only go up. so. They get a, about a, you know, 10, 12 percent annual return on that investment. Thank you. Earlier this evening, you made reference to approximately 10 people or so who could be purchasing electricity from your farm. Um, are they Mill Road residents, and how would you go about selling electricity to other people? So the the 10 people that I mentioned are friends, uh, family acquaintances that we've talked to about this project. Um, anybody who's in Central Hudson's coverage area would be eligible to purchase power as part of the um, community solar project through SunCommon or some organization that we set up together. Um, is how it works. You need a a company that has their skill to resell the power and it would be sold at either equivalent or rebated cost to what Central Hudson's charging. So yes, I don't know anybody. Um, Mike or Jeff, I don't want to get too far into the weeds here on cost benefits, but we're throwing some numbers out now. Cost of about eight hundred thousand dollars, about a ten percent return, eighty thousand a year, and that the cost of screening would be too burdensome. Do you have? You must then have calculated what the cost of screening would be. So I just want to get a sense of how that compares to the numbers you. So the there's thousands of feet of road side here. 
I don't remember exactly what the total number is. I think it's like, I want to say it's over 2,000 feet. So to screen the roofs, to plant 2,000 feet of trees that will grow to 30 feet in height, it's, I mean, it's a crazy amount of money. Um, okay. so you're it's a long, ballpark. But we don't I, have a, a number. I don't know. I haven't, I haven't, no. I mean, what I was hoping originally when we went to the planning board that we'd be able to do is use the law says existing coniferous and deciduous what's there yeah. um, the problem is that you know if 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 Bob is being completely honest and what he doesn't want to see is the solar panels and he doesn't mind the buildings to get to that from anywhere on Mill Road is not a small order. Right. I, it I totally changes the finances. The finances. Now, and what, what it does is make a community solar system where we can provide power for more than just our own use. Like, why would we do that? Because we can we can put what we need here, <clears throat> find agricultural uses for more, and develop the resource that way. And there's no screening requirement at all. So what we're really trying to do is figure out a way to do this and be able to provide power to other users. Yeah, I'm, I'm really just trying to, I guess, tease apart whether or not there might be areas of compromise that could satisfy all parties. Maybe there aren't, but you know, maybe there are key areas along the road that are much more important than others. Maybe there are ways to, with benign neglect, let some grow I, off without investing much. I, I feel where you're going. Um, and the reason we appealed is because the law is so unclear and what we've faced seems so unreasonable. It doesn't look like we'd want to go through that. Um, I mean, you know, everybody says, well, I just don't want to have to see them. I understand. You're saying it's really <laughs> just seeing a different color. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, all that aside, <clears throat> that leaves us open. And then there's a, in, in, the, in the screening requirement, which I understand if you have ground-mounted systems that are covering the land, so all you can see is solar panels. I mean, I've seen those installations. We all have. That's not what this is. The land's going to be covered in animals <laughs> and grass. I mean, these buildings and this installation secure 70 acres of open land for the town for the 20-year period that the buildings are there. It's better than the ag law in terms of open space preservation. We're doing that either way. But the cost of coming back every three years, checking to see if everybody likes the screening, and we have to screen a roof, it starts to look really intimidating. That's why we're here. Yeah. But again, is there any way to give a ballpark as to what the screening would be? And the other thing, Jeff, I know you said about a 10 or 12% return, but if we do not, if, if we side uh, with the interpretation of the town representative, how much do you lose in income from not being able to sell to the community? Um, in real almost, numbers. It almost doubled the cost of the project. Um, we uh, were doing um, a lot of screening for the ground mount systems, um, but they're low to the ground and they're set back from um, from the property lines and the, the screening that we're able to utilize to screen those are, you know, we can plant six foot high giant green arborvitae, which are our preferred um, tree that we're doing. I'm, I'm sorry, could you just say again what you would plant in this? A six, I'll give you an example. So I, my number is coming from six foot high giant green arborvitae that we're, we've planted. They're, it's an evergreen that the deer in theory won't eat. Um, 
we're, we're doing a system right now in the town of Chester in Orange County. We have a, um, a 200 foot section of that, of giant green arborvitae, six feet high, and that's costing us about $50,000. This would be um, about four times as long and six foot high uh, giant green arborvitae aren't going to screen anything. They're not going to screen these buildings. The hedgerows that we're uh, proposing would uh, provide better screening than the giant green arborvitae. They would take years to grow. It, with another application we have in front of the planning board, we're being asked to put in a cluster of, a small cluster of pine trees that will be high enough uh, to basically provide about 12 foot high screening from a single window this big at a house um, in a room that the homeowner rarely goes in. And um, we're looking at $40,000 for that cluster of pine trees that are already sufficiently sized at 12 feet and wide enough to screen just that tiny window. If we're talking about screening uh, 800 feet of linear frontage on Mill Road, that's it double the cost of the project. So least. Jeff, can I just jump in for a minute? And it, it'd be completely mm -hmm. unviable, completely unviable. I think as you know, our part of our job is to balance the individual benefits uh, proposed here with the possible community detriments. And one of the, I guess one of the things I'm trying to drill down into is what does the community really care about? And I understand it's a scenic road. I've been down many times. It's beautiful. Part of the beauty is seeing the property. And part of the potential downside to screening is that you wouldn't see much of the property. So there may be sort of a, a backfire, a bit of a backfire in there. And I wonder if part of the solution might be to shield or screen the parts of the property I'm sorry, the buildings as they are visible from the neighbors' houses. Maybe that alone might suffice in satisfying the good part of, and I see some hands nodding. So maybe it's not a 3,000 foot stretch, but a few hundred feet here and there um, that might, I'm seeing a lot of shaking. Yeah, and so I think that that would be, uh, it'd still be completely impossible to screen a 26 foot high roof that's that long year-round because then the other the other argument we get into is we say we'll plant deciduous trees they say well the leaves come off we'll be able to see the roof you can't screen something that's 26 feet high up, well, in, but up in the air and 368 feet long you just can't so screen this might it be something that the board i think in a site visit might really help us yeah uh, and, look I, at and I think that was I, what I, the, the town intended when they wrote the law. They didn't require screening of roofs anywhere. Even in section I-14, which uh, the ZEO referred to, which is a, the section about screening, it doesn't say roof systems. I, I, and in section I-15, it says no solar panel edge can be higher than 12 feet. It also doesn't say anything about roof systems, but clearly it doesn't apply to roof systems. I, I think we understand the distinctions you're trying to make about the absence of language in, in the zoning law. So I appreciate your calling all that out. But I'd like to just make a couple of comments about screening in general, because I've been involved in a lot of discussions. I've been on the neighborhood side when we wanted screening with something that was happening. And one, you know, it may be that from certain sight lines, you don't have to have a 26 foot tall tree to screen a 26 foot tall right. roof. So a site visit, I think, would be very, very helpful here. And the other thing is, I've seen different decisions where screening decisions have been made knowing that those trees are going to grow. And that in the first year, they're not gonna screen the 26 foot high roof, but in X years, I, you know, I mean, I myself planted a bunch of uh, Norway spruce or something, which the deer don't like. They're not as fast growing as Arborvita, but they're a lot longer <clears throat> lived in terms of what they'll do. So I just, you know, I think one, I think it'd be really helpful for us to make a site visit and just get a sense of the rise and fall of the land, if nothing else, and the length of, of the area. But so I, I think we're all trying to say, is there somewhere that we can reach a compromise? So 
Um, that was our goal in going to the planning board and, and spending the money and preparing a visual impact study. Um, the reason we're here is after getting professionals to do renderings, um, it is really difficult and cost prohibitive to screen things that are on the roof. <clears throat> and I understand that you want to split the baby. <laughs> I get it. Um, and that was our, that was how we went into this process. But you need to I, all, see. All, all I'm saying is that even in instances where the planning board, be it in one instance that I was involved in, said yes, there has to be screening, then there was a discussion. You know, if we agreed with the zoning officer and said yes, there has to be screening, then there was a discussion about okay, how much, what kind, where, you know, you went back and forth. So let, let me let me give you a hypothetical. Um, Williams comes in and wants to put solar panels on all of their lumber sheds. And now has to screen the lumber yard to the height where you can't see the roofs. Does that seem reasonable to change the color of the roof and get all the benefits of the solar? That's why we're here talking to you. Uh, no. I don't. That's a good analogy. Yeah, I don't have. I really understand wanting to control how something looks across the street from your house. I get it. It. It is something we all feel. A scenic roadway changes. We make it more agricultural, but we put these big buildings in. That's a big change. Someone changes their roof from asphalt to standing seam. It's a big change. You may not like the way it looks. I would say that if you look around the town at all the buildings that could have this kind of a system on it, and that in the next 20 years will. Like this may all end up being, we may all be treading water here because like California, the state may say, you gotta put these on roofs. Well, and that's a good, um, issue because you know are we really a legislative body who should be changing the law or should the town law or the town board go back and change the law well, amend the law to make it clear what they meant that's 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 one way this could go that's one way this could go I but think you guys could look at this and say but we're here to interpret the law I we're understand. not here as a legislative body I think you could look at the law and say it's not reasonable, and that's the standard of the law, to ask people to We're here to interpret. We're a, uh, well, you can I, I understand John. what you're saying. There's yeah. other avenues, though, and, and, and uh, one of them may be to go back to the town. The laws are amended regularly because there are issues, uh, you, and, and that may be you the may way find, to go here. You may find that you guys need to do that. I think that if you look at this in the analogy that I just gave you, that there are roofs all over town, and what we're talking about is changing the texture and color of the roof, really. And whether it's because you do that, it's reasonable to ask people to screen the whole roof from view. To, to the issue of changing the color of texture, several speakers have commented on how the sheds were acceptable. Um, what specifically about the color and texture change? We haven't raised the issue about color. Another person at another meeting did, but none of the people here who are directly impacted by that. Change me what you don't like about the city, right? Or the color of the roof. This is where your sight is involved come in. Yep. You have to see. Maybe, I, let me try to be more clear. I, I, if I'm not mistaken, a couple of you spoke to the fact that the sheds themselves, without the solar array, yes. were, were yes. acceptable, if pastoral, right? If they're, if they're pastoral barns right. that work in the area, that, and, and it's pleasant to see that, and hopefully the area around it would be maintained without the solar, let's just say, but 
it is, I think, a welcome addition to what I see from across my phone. Right. So then, I'm just trying to understand, is it the color or the texture? No, it's not. It's neither. Nothing. It's well, fine the way it is. The, the barns are fine the way they are. Right. The color of the roofs are fine. No, I know, but if, if, if they go ahead and, and put the solar panels on top, there must be some particular uh, aspect of that that changes your opinion. Well, because what you be, be, have be, Because to me, it's just, it's color and texture. It's thinking about ourselves, who are homeowners, but also thinking about the people that come down the road, right? Uh, so the first part of it is, even if we were to screen our homes, which, you know, I'm not going there, but that would mean that we would not see the solar panels, but everybody else who comes down would see the world would. So that sort of, you know, is a big point. But when you have something so dramatic as solar panels, now, in an area that is you know, really forest. You you see the solar panels first. You're but not seeing the water. If I'm driving down the road after the, the solar installation is put in, I'm going to have to get relatively close to determine that it's solar panels. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. Okay, so so that's good. That, that's that's what I'm trying to get at. The scale is, of this in this setting yeah. is that it's a very large, large. Building but in a very, very the premise setting. of my the premise it's of my not like William's the premise of my question was and maybe I misunderstood the speakers, but I understood you said about I think you said that the sheds as built now were not unpleasant. So it there's only one thing changing when it becomes solar. At least I, I mean I'm, I must be missing the point. That's a radical change. Looking at those solar panels on the roof, it, 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 it um, presents a discordant view shift now. You're having an agricultural activity, then a commercial activity. Right. Okay. It turns it into an industrial power plant. <laughs> That's what it looks like, you know, versus a pastoral farm scene. And it's very industrial looking solar power plants, and that quantity of them in two really huge sheds. It's just going to turn it into a, an industrial looking zone versus a pastoral one. But, but they could put it, it up anyway if they didn't sell it to the community. Yes. So, well, I get. 10% is going to the agricultural activities. Yeah. So. Correct on that. I know he's correct on that. And so, and so that's what I'm saying to you. The, the, the panels could be up there anyway. The only thing that brings us here today is the fact that they want to sell to the community. And be compliant. Well, I, I understand that, but but I'm just saying. It's a much vaster array. If they just have the array. Well, it, it, it depends because if they say they, and I don't know what the percentage is. Maybe I should have. That question came out, and I did not. Forty percent was it? Yeah. How much would, is going to be used now for the agricultural versus how much is going to be sold to to the community? And you said that if you didn't get the interpretation you wanted, you. <laughs> Could could add more, could, you, add more agricultural. you could add more to the agricultural. You could put in a greenhouse with lights. And how much, I mean, how big and would that? that could use all the power. So we we you, could you, find a use on the farm for all the power that these buildings could produce. Because it's I, cheap I, power. In other words, it becomes something that makes sense for us to find a farm use for. And maybe eventually we would do that anyway and cycle off the community side to a certain extent and as we built out farm uses for cheap power. But if the interpretation goes your way, is it your, is it your intent to still put up what you propose but simply funnel that extra energy to, to other uses on the farm? Absolutely. We'll, I mean, we'll use a certain amount of this power. And that, that could... I mean, we've got an indoor riding arena that has lots of lights in it. There's outdoor lights that could go from one of the... I mean, it, there's uses right now for 
some of the power. I don't remember exactly what our kilowatt uses are. So, so if the interpretation does not go your way, you're going to put up this system regardless and then just find another use for it on the farm? There will be panels on the buildings right away and we will find a way to use as much of that resource as possible. We have, you know, it's valuable resource. And, and every agricultural building in the country is gonna look like this in 15 years. So the idea of a pastoral view that doesn't have solar panels on it is kind of stuck because this resource needs to be used. It's valuable. And because you have to build these huge buildings to store your equipment, house your animals, put the hay in, they're all gonna get this on them. And it may be the next generation, which instead of being a panel, is actually the roof, in which case we wouldn't have to be here. A building integrated system, we wouldn't have to come in. And you wouldn't see the difference. The law as it is right now says building integrated systems require no approval at all. And we're like five years away from this being a building integrated system. Can I ask a question? Yeah. So we live in a small community, and I know that we're referencing a lot of different places, but we're talking here about Rhinebeck. And one of the one of the beautiful things about Rhinebeck is we live with our neighbors pretty harmoniously. And having a good neighbor and having a relationship and doing things that work within the compound, which means that maybe there is we're doing some sort of wiggle room. That's something that, you know, we're willing to listen to, you know, as opposed to saying no, 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 no. So having good neighbors is important. And I think that's what we're talking about, being able to live together on this road. The other piece that, that, that I kind of bring up is what would the cost be for you to move those sheds 500 feet back, meaning that if it's all of this, you know, you don't even have to worry about, you know, selling an outside. If you just move the sheds, and, and, and they're lovely, and I saw they were built in a short amount of time, but to just take them and move them back, you know, what would that take? Do and you, then we're done. Would you feel like I was a good neighbor if I came to you and said, your house is too close to the road? Would you please move it 500 feet back? Well, you wouldn't have to say that because my house is as far back as it could possibly sit. Because it's the wetland behind it. No, because the people who built the house wanted to try to sit. So that's why my house is so far back. But I, I would never come to you with a request that was out, out there somewhere, which is what you were saying. That's not a good analogy. We well, it, no, about you about working within. So, what's being asked of us, and we're sitting here shaking our heads and saying, we will work with you in a way that will conform to our problems, since we're primarily the ones who will be affected, right? And hopefully this can set a precedence showing that this is a town that hears both sides. That's really all I'm saying. I want to continue living harmoniously with you for the last how many years? You know, we come and go, we have a decent relationship. I respect your driveway, you respect mine. I want to continue that. And I think that we can find a way to do that. That's all I'm saying, Michael. Uh, so this building, which is the one that's closest to you. Correct, the two buildings, well, the A and the... There's a very steep hill 50 feet behind that building. So we cannot move any farther back than it is. And that's the building that's closest to the road and with the exception of your house, it's farther away than every other house on the road. But when I come out to my, to my when I come outside of my house and I get into my driveway, it's the same as what everybody else will see. So essentially, my panorama mm -hmm. are your 
panels, um, unless I never come out of my house. So, Look, I understand that. I know, and I know you do like it. It's a, it's a huge change. I get it. And the reason I'm here is not because I'm not sensitive to what you're experiencing, but because the discussion that you were just having um, the zoning law is there to protect me too. And it's there to protect people who want to put up solar panels. This part of the town is designated as an area where these kind of systems can go in. And all of your houses are built closer to the road than current zoning would allow. But, hmm. but, but Michael, that's it's, true it's of a, a huge no, percentage not, of not, Rhinebeck. What's that? I said that's true of a huge percentage of Rhinebeck. Sure, and in this particular part of Rhinebeck, there's a thousand acres of farmland and a group of five homes that were built on half acre lots in 1970 all at once in the middle. So it's, it, it's very discordant build out. It's a huge problem. But, but it's, it's not just a huge problem for me. And while my property is what you consider your view shed, it's also my property. But now, you know, the question was never answered, and I, I again, I, I... They can't move back because the field's not that deep. No, but not even that. <laughs> I cannot tell you how back to the city property. Everything is done, utmost deal, uh, it's beautiful. I mean, I love driving around there. I mean, it is a beautiful piece of property, and I've watched you over the years develop it slowly and carefully. I've seen what you're capable of doing, and it's magnificent. I'm so proud of this. I'm sorry that you don't like it. I really no, no, no. am. Well, <laughs> all right, all right. I, I, I think we, we're getting to the point of diminishing my, returns here, so. My question to you is, so in, given what you have done, why would you not want to continue that along a certain part of Mill Road that would conform with all the other work that you have done so, to develop your property. So one of the things that, that Dave Tobias said, and that I believe, is that more people will want to see this than not. Because the fields, when, they're, when, they, when they green over, and the animals that are going to be out there, is going to be a beautiful addition to the view shed, with the panels <coughs> and the buildings. I think that as upsetting as it is for you, the change, and thinking about what it might look like, I think five years from now, nobody's gonna want the screen, because it's gonna be beautiful. And it's gonna be exactly what you're talking about, Susan. All right, Do, um, does anybody have any new arguments? All right, um, this is a somewhat complex um, issue with a lot of very good arguments made by both sides. Um, uh, we're going to need to consult with our legal counsel. This is uh, a matter, I believe, of first impression. I don't believe there's any case law on it because it is so new. And uh, so my proposal uh, is to uh, hold open the public hearing to give us more time to um, research the matter and, and, and um, deal with our legal counsel on the issue. You also want to make a site visit as well? We want to make a site visit. Um, since the public hearing uh, will be uh, open, uh, again, if, if some, it's been briefed very well by all the sides, but if somebody has one last argument they want to make, we'll be, be willing to accept uh, papers. Uh, and I would anticipate we can probably at the next public hearing, which would be in January, uh, entertain uh, a motion to close the public hearing because hopefully by then I will have had our uh, site visit and hopefully had the research done. Um, and, and that's what I anticipate going forward. So, so uh, is there enough time to notify people if the next public hearing is on January 9th since it's a little bit earlier. Two and a half weeks away. 
Yeah. Well, you don't need to re-notice because you're yeah. not closing it. You're just. Yeah. Oh, okay. It. All right. Okay. Great. Um, my wife's name is Jamie Keibel, and she'll kill me if I don't tell you that we're not the Decolas. <laughs> so when, <laughs> when everybody refers to the property, it's Michael Decola, Dr. Jamie Keibel. Thank you. So noted. <laughs> Okay, with that, um, I'm, I'm going to make a motion that we uh, continue the uh, public hearing until uh, the next public hearing uh, date, which is? January 9th. January 9th. Do I have a second? Second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, thank you everyone for uh, all of your arguments. No time January 9th? Same time as always. Uh, well, it'll be 7.30 when the meeting starts. I'm not sure exactly when it will be scheduled for. 7.45. 7.45. But get here at 7.30 is probably good. Hopefully there'll be another. Uh, well, we shouldn't all go together. We should, we should go so together. we should do it separately. Um, so we'll just go out. It's easy. It's easy. Just drive. You can see it from the roadway. Aha. Uh Gotta be soon. Okay, so what do you need from me? Okay. Why don't I... I always use pencil because... So, you know, because I can erase and because the nun. And be, you need to go. No, no, because, huh? You can't have this erased. See, the thing is, I probably do too. the nuns wouldn't let me use a pen because my penmanship was so poor. Right in my head, so. He'll know. Um, yes, I have not adjourned the meeting. No, we have not, but I want to get these guys out of here. They've been suffering. <laughs> Not a problem. Yeah, uh, if okay. I kept an eye on Scott. They, they were very. Good. They were very patient. I was looking. For there was no sleep no, in or I was anything. Looking, I was watching. He was joking a little bit, but that's good. That's good. I know my kids went through the, the school system. They had to do this too. Well, it's it's a little dry, but it's very important. It's and it was reasonably civil, which was nice. It's a quiz question. Pick out the two lawyers. Yeah, you need to do that. There's more two people don't understand. Oh, three. Excuse me. Pick out pick out the three attorneys. You gotta understand. Four. If you need anything more, just let me know. Okay, my pleasure. Thank you. Thanks for uh, wait, keeping awake. All right. Take care. What's the continuing still rolling? Yeah, the meeting's still rolling. Um, Time to come in. Oh, I mean, come on, no, no, no. no, but what I mean is, John, we're still. Yes. Okay. Yep. Just hang out. For okay. A second. All right. <laughs> All right, gang. Um, we don't have um, anything else on the agenda. Is there any old business we need to go over? Any oh, old business? Oh, sorry. I was just old late. business. Do you want to leave? No. Is that? Are you, are you, is that no, I'm just, you've had enough. I was, I was out of. I was out of order. I'm okay. Sorry. <laughs> Um, all right, if there's no additional business, uh, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Uh, I motion to adjourn. I'm sorry. And is there a second? I'll motion second to adjourn. I'll second and third. Aye. All right, all in favor? Aye. 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 All right. That's it. <laughs>